need to help people to understand what I was saying in terms of how do you retire if you can't get the asset out of the one thing that you were counting on, which is your home? How do you think about who's going to take over the job that you were doing so Social Security will continue to operate? How do you think about the community where you want to live and, re and perhaps retire in place and be able to enjoy all the cultural amenities of the city? Can you do that if that city is not a safe place? The public transportation system that you need so when your son or daughter takes away your driver's license, you can continue to move around. That public transportation system is the same one that uh, that low-income Latina mother of three needs. So we need to paint a different picture about what your taxes do for you, not what it does for them, what it does for you. Eva, I know that's tough to follow. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, but <laughs> I, I think it's also important to talk about the cost of not doing it. Um, and when we created, here's my little plug, Shared Prosperity, the city's anti-poverty plan, um, in 2013, we had looked at what the city was spending working with low-income individuals, people living in poverty, in 2010, and then we looked again at the 2012 numbers. And absent the school district, it's $700 million. Um, so that is a tremendous amount of money that is going into, um, you know, not even hopefully mitigating the impact of poverty, but not necessarily helping people move out of poverty, um, or not, you know, 100% um, helping people move out of poverty. Some of that is for job training, but it's health services, it's behavioral health services, um, it's other social services, it's, you know, it's, it's a variety of, of expenditures the city has. Um, um, the, you know, and, and it's also not including the prison system. Um, and um, so there are tremendous expenses and costs that are both economic and non-economic of not doing this work. And I think we don't acknowledge those costs right now, the, the cost of inaction. And so I think in addition to having the data and showing, you know, literally the return on investment for this kind of work, you have to, you know, we are spending the money now already. We're just spending it in a backwards way. Um, and that's why, you know, the new financing technique, pay for success, um, is all about the cost of if you provide um, high quality early learning, then children will do better in school and their life outcomes will be better. And so you can actually pay for the cost of early learning um, by those savings later on. The same thing if you provide um, services to people who have a criminal record so they can get back in the job market, they're then contributing to the economy. And the reason that financing mechanism is even, you know, being worked on now is because there are savings that we get down the road when we invest now. And so I think we have to be very clear that we are spending the money now but not getting the effect that we want. Councilman, sometimes the return is a lot more immediate. Sometimes I find that we don't even get the story out fast enough. We, we did a, a small report last week that showed for a $1,300 investment in a training program in Philadelphia, by year two, the city was a plus almost $1,000 in wage taxes for that individual because they were working by year two and they had already paid off what was actually spent on them. Why is it so hard for us to, to get that story out there? We need to be uh, a little more aggressive in telling uh, the good work that we're doing um, here in the city of Philadelphia. And, and specifically when you have initiatives um, such as the one you just spoke of, and it really showing the success side. I think when we go in front of the groups such as the Chamber of Commerce in Philadelphia, and they actually see how those type of programs are benefit to move this city of Philadelphia forward, that adds to the dialogue and the conversation regarding those public policy things that we're advocating in the city council, that's a benefit for those most in need and not so much being adversarial um, to the business community. But when you talk about the issue of taxes and um, whose taxes are being utilized to uplift people out of poverty, well, during our last governor's race, um, there was a, a former governor who took a no tax pledge and said, I'm not going to use my taxes to support public education. I'm not going to use my taxes to support, um, I'm not going to raise taxes to support those social service programs that primarily support people in the city of Philadelphia. He's no longer the governor. We have a new governor who's going to focus on public education. We have a new governor who's going to focus on um, 
restoring uh, the support for those programs that primarily support low-income individuals. And so, um, at least in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, we will have an opportunity during the next eight years to begin addressing some of those issues because, you know, to be quite frank, and I'm an elected official, I'm a politician, a lot of these things are, a lot of decisions are political decisions. Budget priorities are based upon who is elected and what their priorities are. And oftentimes, I know the last eight years for a fact, it definitely wasn't the low-income community in the city of Philadelphia, um, for that matter, throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So I think the horizon looks great for the next eight years to begin um, having a more aggressive conversation in addressing some of these issues. Well, that's a good, uh, I think, a time for me to open up questions to all of you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to kick off this conversation and uh, have this gentleman right here, if you don't mind standing up. I'm not sure if there's a mic at all out in the audience. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Charles Lanier, and I am uh, in the interim 